Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming and Last Epoch. Now we've had some time to sink our teeth into the game, you might be like myself, working your way through the end game to the true end game. I'm currently about to unlock Empowered Monoliths. Now something that came up a lot during beginner advice and discussion is the crafting system. And this is vital for the end game gearing I'm doing right now. As you can see, this has no more forging potential. I can't do any more to it. Same for my head, same for my shield here, my rings. I am just maxing these out as best I can. And the result is an incredibly powerful build while I'm going. I'm absolutely dumbstring and I'm able to push empowered monoliths even though I'm well under level 90. I'm dumbstring bosses and clearing out zones no problem and that's because I'm really engaging with the crafting in well an educated way and so today I'm gonna help you understand that. Let's start with the actual item types of your equipment. We have the white commons here, the magic blues, the rare yellows. These are common fare you see them even throughout all of the campaign you know about those. Next we have the uniques. These are set unique items that are you know basically limited to what they are. We have Dream Thorn here, a two-handed sword that you're just going to find, and there it is. It has set affixes that you can't change, you can't craft or mess with at all. Let's pretend this long sword is actually a two-handed sword, like Dream Thorn. If I were to try to use a Rune of Ascendance on that, well then, if it was a two-handed sword, it'd roll all of the potential uniques that are two-handed swords, and because of that, I might even get another Dream Thorn. Then we have these greens, the set items. These are basically, you have multiple from the same set, the more you have, the more power you get. So here, with two of this set, I'd get 20 health gain on stun, or three, I'd get 30 strength. Usually sets aren't that good, they're very restricted, but we'll see at 1.0. Lastly, we have two more important ones. We have the purples, which are called exalted items, and they're insane for their affix potential, especially with one of them, as you can see here, being highlighted, it rolls way higher than normal. Normally, you can craft and get something to a tier five. Here, that highlighted affix is actually a tier six, and that's the same when I look at my gloves one here with cast speed, or this ring. We've got physical resistance at tier six. These these are kind of your end game items. It's quite hard to get like the role you're looking for with the roles around that that you can craft and mess with, but it is possible. And so yeah, you're looking for these as part of an end game set. Technically, there's another item type that I should mention, which is experimental items. As you can see, it's kind of yellow and purple. They have these experimental affixes, like this really good one here that causes my health to be lost per second, but I get ward per second, which can be used for different builds. The last really important item I want to explain though is legendaries, which hey, this hand of judgment is isn't, but it has legendary potential on it, just one. That could have rolled from one to four. And all it really means is when I'm crafting a legendary, it's going to give me extra affixes, in this case only one, but it could be up to four. To craft legendaries, you need to go do the Temporal Sanctum Dungeon. There's like a monolith crafting device in there. And all you need to do is take one purple item and one unique, slam them together, and you turn it into a legendary. Based on the unique's legendary potential, you'll get up to four extra affixes when you craft that. And it's basically just making a unique stronger, giving it more affixes, more potential. So they're obviously very good, and you'd want the ideal uniques that you're running to be eventually upgraded, as it were, into legendaries. To get all these things settled, we use the crafting system. So let's first cover the rune types and how they're very important for reaching what you need. Very quickly, I'm just gonna talk about runes of shattering because they are very straightforward and you probably already know. You take an item, it's got some stuff on it. You do a rune of shattering. It'll take some of these and give me an amount. So technically the most I could get here is two melee physical damage, one critical strike chance, and one stun chance with melee attacks. Instead, I got two of three and that's the RNG of shattering. If we're looking for something really specific, like I want to keep this tier 5 healing effectiveness ideally, I would instead use the runes of removal. This is going to pick one of the four here at random and then take the whole thing. So I'll get all tier 6 shards of block effectiveness, or all tier 5 element resist, or all of the increased healing effectiveness. Or worst case scenario, it'll pick the armor one, and I'll only get the one shard and waste the rune. That consumes forging potential though, and as I've got zero left on the shield, I actually can't do that in this case. But you'll very commonly be using your shatterings and your runes of removal to get the shards that you need as you find a new piece of gear and upgrade and move to that. But as I said, we can also make use of an item and turn it into a unique by just using these runes of ascendance. We find them throughout the campaign, through monolith grinding for the end game, they just happen. And they take something, like say these pair of gloves, and turn them into a unique from that set. So I'm going to get a unique pair of gloves when I do this. I have no idea what kind it's going to be. Look, I got the hubris gloves. So that random blue item has now become a unique. And sadly, it did not have any legendary potential, which could have been useful. Very commonly, you'd use that on boots to start with, because most unique boots come with a lot of movement speed, which is just good for your progression and your leveling. But if you're running a build that is specific, 
specifically using uniques and they're very important or even functional required to make that build work, then you're going to want to be using your Rune of Ascendance on that. Let's say I desperately need an amulet for my build to work. Well, then all of my Rune of Ascendancies will go into amulets until I get it. Moving on to some simple runes like the Rune of Refinement. This rerolls the values of all affixes on an item within its tier. So basically on this sword, we have a plus eight melee physical damage. That's a tier one. Let's say that could have rolled, I don't know, from plus four to plus 12. So I've got a like mid roll here. I could take a rune of refinement and re-roll those, taking it from a plus eight to a plus six. So it actually went down on the melee physical. You would never do that on a top roll, but on a bad roll of something you really care about, that could fix the roll and make it more valuable. That is certainly a very important thing to be doing. Next, we have the all important runes of discovery. This adds random tier one affixes to all the empty slots on an item. So you could take like a common or a rare or whatever that's just got very lacking affixes, or at least an amount of them, slap a bunch on. You could find an item that has a really good affix, high rolled on it, but it's got no other affixes, or very few. Using Runes of Discovery then, you slap on a bunch of RNG ones, and it actually has a higher chance of rolling rarer relevant affixes for you. So this is fantastic. And it's how I create the base of an item relevant to my build whenever I find something particularly good, like a high rolled affix for my build. Next, we have the Rune of Shaping, which is very simple. It re-rolls all the implicits on an item. The implicits are the thing at the top, so this is a shield, right? It has 26% block chance. It's got the block effectiveness, the endurance. And if I was to use a rune of shaping, well, then I would re-roll those things at the top. Implicits are really important when you're leveling. And once you reach the monolith system, you kind of reach like a high point of it. I've got 47% increased fire damage and 27% increased healing effectiveness, which isn't a great roll. So let's re-roll that. And now we have 40% increased fire damage and 56 increased healing effectiveness. That's so much more. So what I've just done is taken this item with kind of bad implicit rolls that I was using and made it better, made it way more effective. Now, awkwardly, one of the last runes I've not got right now is the Rune of Creation, which is kind of weird. It creates another copy of an item on use, but it makes the original and the dupe both have zero forging potential, so you can't actually craft those anymore. You would consider using that when crafting certain legendaries, an item that you're not going to forge on at all anymore. So creating a dupe of that might allow you to forge another relevant legendary, but that's very neat and very, very end game. The other one is just the Rune of Research. It slaps an experimental affix on. It is unlikely you'll be doing a lot of that, but experimental affixes can be very good and relevant to certain builds. Okay, so that's the runes. Then we have the five glyphs. Obviously, you'll know the Glyph of Hope. You're using these constantly because it means sometimes when you're doing a craft, you don't lose any forging potential, which is wonderful. Something I've been using a lot while powering up and gearing up is Glyphs of Chaos, though. You target a specific affix by going to upgrade it with a Glyph of Chaos equipped. It's going to then change that affix from whatever it is to something else. So let's say you've got a three out of four perfect item and it's got this awkward as hell fourth affix you don't care about. You could use a Glyph of Chaos to re-roll that specific specific affix and maybe get something that's relevant. It'll also upgrade it because you are doing that, but be aware that you can't turn a suffix into a prefix or a prefix into a suffix. There's a certain pool of prefixes and it's going to roll from them or vice versa. Next then we have the glyph of order. It prevents the roll of an affix within its range changing when it's upgraded. So when you take an affix and actually upgrade it, it might roll higher or lower than what it was before. Glyph of order basically just means, nope, if you had a good roll and you're upgrading it, it's going to stay a good roll, which can be good on a nice you plan on using for a long time and you're being very careful with the upgrading of it. Then we have the all-important glyph of despair. This has a chance to seal an affix instead of upgrading it. The sealed affix will now get its own new slot. So an item that had four affixes could now have five potentially. You just have to put another one back on. So having enough forging potential is important. This is really good though. Any item you're planning on using for a long time, why not have an extra affix? The problem here though, is it actually gets harder to successfully pull this off the higher tier of the affix you're targeting. So this forces you to take a low or even tier one rolled affix and try and seal it. So that limits the potential. However, there are different types of affixes where, you know, leveling it up doesn't really improve it. So there are certain affixes that are optimal to actually seal using Glyphs of Despair. And so these are really important. You want to hang on to them so you know what you're doing. Lastly, the weird and probably underused Glyph of Insight. I don't even have one. It changes a prefix into an experimental affix and it requires 
Really specific stuff to work. It also only works on gloves, boots, and belts with different potential on each of them. You'd intentionally set up the items to make certain results more likely, but it's so niche, so specific and awkward to even attempt that the glyph is largely underused. So if you want to follow an in-depth guide with that, you absolutely can, but let's move on. So those are the runes and glyphs of importance, what they do, how, and even when you'd use them. They'll drop randomly whenever you're playing, and obviously when you reach the end game, you'll get more options. But in the monolith end game system, you can actually find rewards for the nodes within, the echo, Echoes, and it'll be like, hey, you can get some extra runes for this. When you complete that echo, then you'll get a pile of them at the end, and that could be a great way to build up a base of them, and I'd strongly recommend you target them if you don't have any. But now let's just go over some quick general tips for you to be aware of. If you're looking to farm out some shards and do a lot of shattering, you can actually go to every hub with traders. Each trader will have like a pile of shattering shards for you to pick up, so I can just buy these and be happy with a bunch that I've got now. But there's nothing stopping me from pulling up the map and going to like a different era and finding like a hub like the keeper's camp the original one and going and speaking with a the vendor there picking up all the shards that npc is holding and then going to this town and doing the same there to that npc and go to a completely different era and do that this way you can pick up tons of shards in one go if you're lacking on those shattering npcs reset when you progress anything really in the game giving you more options to actually get more next be aware that critical successes can happen it's just an rng mechanic that can occur whenever you craft anything sometimes it'll just happen and then you get to lose no forging potential on whatever craft you just did, which is amazing. It can add a random affix that's below tier five to an item as a bonus. And you can use that mechanic to your advantage by leveling up something you don't care about and the crit success happening and it levels the one you do care about. A lot of RNG there, but basically when critical success happens, you don't lose anything and you get the bonuses. It's like a free craft. The last thing I wanna mention is these resistances. Achieving the cap for different resistances isn't as important as you might imagine it is, at least contextually. You don't need this 75% cap in everything. There's not actually a huge difference between say 74% and 75%. So I wouldn't pull my hair out trying to achieve 75% if I'm at like, I don't know, 73. Some resistances are way more important than others. Physical is gonna be very important. Most of the enemies are gonna be using physical attacks, but specific elements become really important, especially late game, depending on what you're doing. You might come across a bunch of necrotic enemies in the next section, or maybe you're dealing with Lagon, and so you really want that lightning resistance. You will come across specific types of enemies that are going to hit hard in one element. Having higher resistance is going to be great, but it should be as simple as checking these stats and going, mm, I'm really lacking on poison. So in future crafting or item drops, I'm going to have that in mind and try to get that up if I need to. But yeah, there you have it. That's my more in-depth look at the different resources and aspects of crafting with late game in mind. I hope this information and advice within has helped you. And if you guys have any extra details about crafting for Endgame, anything I've not mentioned in this video, then you can drop it in the comments. But for now, I've been Hollow, you've been you, thanks for watching. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos. Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes. Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice. To reiterate that it is nice. To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage. Is, uh, goodbye.